Okay, Katie, I think I'll go ahead and get started. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome back to the Dharma Doors. Uh, I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And we are off on another Dharma adventure tonight. Um, actually, I'm going to switch my view. There we go. Um, uh, yeah, we're off on a new, uh, I'm going to open a new Dharma door tonight, or at least to start cracking the door. Um, this is, is exciting. We're back in our, um, the Ratnakuta Sutra, the heap of jewels. Uh, for those of you that have the Chang uh, translation, uh, we're doing Sutra number nine in that. Um, if you're familiar with the heap of jewels, the Ratnakuta, it's actually sutra number 20 of the 49, the collection of 49. Um, I got a lot to say about this. This is a super fun sutra. Um, it sort of affords us an opportunity to do a deep, dirty Dharma dive tonight and get a really some fun ideas. Um, I got a lot on the board tonight. Um, I think the way I'm going to do this one is, yeah, I think I'm going to do the thing where just read a little bit uh, just to set the scene. And then I'll take a moment to uh, explain a few things and we'll dive in. Um, if you're not familiar with the heap of jewels, the Ratnakuta Sutra, I'm not going to go into it tonight, of course, but you can go back, check out the Ashoka Data Sutra. You can check out the... Surata Sutra, all these different sutras that come from this collection that we've been working on. So I'm not going to explain the collection, but I am going to talk about this. Uh, what is the sutra called? Great question. Um, for those of you that uh, you may not know, this collection of sutras, the Maharatnakuta, the heap of jewels, this is a collection of sutras, smaller sutras that have traditionally been put together as like an anthology. This collection, you can find it, we're reading from uh, translations from the Chinese, but in the Tibetan canon, the giant Tibetan canon, there is a, a version of the Heap of Jewels. And we don't have Sanskrit versions of all of these sutras, but what we do have is a pretty old text. I think it's maybe from like the eighth or ninth century. And it's a Sanskrit text in which the person mentions, oh yeah, and there's the Ratnakuta Sutra, which has all 49 of these sutras. And so they list the titles of at least all the sutras. And so between that, that list, and then the entire Tibetan canon that has all of the sutras, from those we can kind of reimagine, or we actually have, the original Sanskrit title for this sutra. So the Sanskrit title would be the Vidya Prapta Paripricha Sutra. Uh, the Paripricha, we've encountered this before, this uh, the questions of Bodhisattva so and so, so and so. And we actually read two weeks ago the Surata Paripricha Sutra. So the questions of the Bodhisattva named Surata. Um, and so this is a format in these sutras, in the Maharatnakuta Sutra collection, which are these paripreachas, the questions of Bodhisattva, and tonight it's Bodhisattva Vidya Prapta, lightning obtainer, Bodhisattva obtainer of lightning. So that's the Sanskrit title. and. Uh, one of the things that you might have started picking up on is that all the Sanskrit titles are basically the name of the star of the show. Bodhisattva Vijaprapta, Bodhisattva Sarata, Bodhisattva Shokadatta, all of that. So they're just named the Bodhisattva. But of course, this collection, they're translating from the Chinese, and the Chinese has a slightly different title for this sutra. They call it the inexhaustible hidden treasures or hidden treasuries. All right. This one translates as the inexhaustible stores of wisdom. And I'm going to talk about why they chose to go with stores of wisdom. Um, 
I'll talk about that in a second when we actually introduce these uh, hidden treasures. But as far as the Chinese goes, this uh, Fuzang, the Fuzang is just hidden treasure. This is like pirates of Penzance time. This is, uh, um, we're talking about hidden Buddhist treasure tonight. Um, so that's going to be kind of the idea of this is, is not in the Chinese, they focus not so much on the star Bodhisattva, but the theme and the theme of tonight are these indestructible or inexhaustible, like you could never get to the bottom of them, the inexhaustible hidden treasures or hidden treasuries. And we're going to find out about those in a second. I just want to say one interesting thing to sort of prime us for tonight. This uh, vidyu prapta, prapta means to obtain um, in the idea of like spiritual attainments or even ideas of uh, once return or non return or our hotship, this idea of obtaining or attainments. Well, that's sort of what's wrapped up in this idea of prapta or the Chinese duh. And this is lightning, vidyu prapta, obtainer of lightning. What could that possibly mean? Well, I'm going to just sort of let you know one subtle etymological thing that's going on here. And it's going to be the relationship between this idea of electricity, lightning, thunder, um, that, that, that idea of like, well, lightning, which is vid, vid you in Sanskrit versus the idea of like uh, wisdom or clear seeing a kind of uh, enlightenment almost is vidya. And you might have heard of vidya rajas, of vidya daras, ob obtainer, vidya daras, like an obtainer of vidya. Vidya, this kind of enlightenment. So it's interesting that in Sanskrit, the vidyu, lightning, and vidya, a kind of enlightenment. Ah, so there's a subtle kind of thing going on in Buddhism with this lightning and enlightenment consciousness, but a higher transcendental consciousness, right? So that's what's our Bodhisattva Vidya Prapta. And so, that, so it's either the, those two titles, the Chinese title or the, the Sanskrit title. And that's all you gotta know. Um, I'm gonna read the beginning of this. And th this is, this is the, the questions of Bodhisattva Vidya Prapta. So he's got questions, he's got ideas on his mind. And so I wanna get to what his questions are. He has questions for the Buddha. So, and what, I, what I'm kind of uh, wanna say with that is that some things are gonna pop up right away that will, might pique your interest. <laughs> you might be curious about them and you may want to stop me, but, but wait, Michael, go, can you go back? Can you just tell us about the non-arising of all dharmas real quick? Could you just stop and tell us about that real quick? I'm not going to do that. So I, you, so I just want to make that clear that like a lot of sutras, ideas come up in the beginning that you're kind of not supposed to get right away. The, the sutra is actually about revealing them. So hold on if you have any questions. Here we go with the Vidya Prapta Paripricha Sutra, otherwise known as the uh, Wu Jin Fu Zhang Hui, the inexhaustible stores of wisdom. Thus have I heard. Once the Buddha was dwelling on Mount Gridrakuta, the vulture's peak, near the great city of Rajgriha, together with 1,000 great monks, all of whom had accomplished superb merits, punya, and could make the lions roar, and with 500 great bodhisattvas, all of whom had acquired dharanis, attained unimpeded eloquence, achieved the realization of the non-arising of all dharmas, reached the stage of non-regression, had acquired samadhis and a free command of miraculous powers, and who knew well the mentalities and inclinations of living beings. The bodhisattvas were headed by the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Sun Banner, 
There were also Bodhisattva Moon Banner, Bodhisattva Universal Light, Bodhisattva Moon King, Bodhisattva Illuminator of Peaks, Bodhisattva Son of the Sun, Bodhisattva Lion's Wisdom, Bodhisattva Precious Light of Merit, Bodhisattva Realization of All Meanings, Bodhisattva Fulfillment of Previous Conditions, Bodhisattva Accomplishment of Vows and Deeds, Bodhisattva Wisdom of Emptiness, Bodhisattva Equal Mind, Bodhisattva Joy and Love, Bodhisattva Fond of Company, Bodhisattva Victorious Fighter, Bodhisattva Wise Deeds, Bodhisattva Lightning Attainment, Vijaprapta, Bodhisattva Superb Eloquence, Bodhisattva Lion's Roar, Bodhisattva Wonderful Voice, Bodhisattva Alert, Bodhisattva Deeds of Skillful Conversion, and Bodhisattva Deeds of Ultimate Quiescence. Also in the assembly were Indra, the four Deva kings, Brahma, Lord of the Saha world, and innumerable, awe-inspiring, virtuous gods, Nagas, Yakshas, Gandharavas, Asuras, Garudas, Kimnaras, and Mahuragas. At that time, Bodhisattva lightning attainment, seeing that all the imminent ones had gathered, and that the whole assembly was hushed, rose from his seat, bared his right shoulder, knelt on his right knee, joined his palms together, and said to the Buddha, World honored one, I wish to ask you some questions. Please grant me the opportunity. The world honored one said to Vijaprapta, the Tathagata, the worthy one, the perfectly enlightened one, grants your request. Ask whatever questions you wish, and the answers will be explained to you. Bodhisattva Vidyaprapta asked the Buddha, World Honored One, what should Bodhisattvas accomplish to be able to satisfy sentient beings' desires? without themselves being afflicted with defilement. To lead sentient beings skillfully according to their particular inclinations and to prevent them from falling into miserable planes of existence after death. To realize without fail the equality of dharmas and to remain undefiled by the world in which one lives, just as a lotus flower is unsoiled by the muddy water from which it grows. How can bodhisattvas travel freely among Buddha lands without moving at all within the Dharma Dhatu, the realm of reality? How can they be always with the Buddha without seeing him as he physically appears? How, how to abide in the three doors of liberation without entering nirvana, how to adorn and purify a Buddha land in accordance with the wishes of sentient beings, and how to attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment in an instant. Then the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Vidyaprapta repeated his questions in verse, saying, Unexcelled, most honored of men, master of infinite knowledge. You abide in the dharmas common to all. You benefit the world and treat living beings with equality. You are a haven of the world. You reveal the right path so that all may attain peace and joy. The supreme merits you have accumulated are like a treasure trove. May the son of wisdom in the world, the worthy one, in the three realms, expound the supreme vehicle for the accomplishment of bodhisattvahood. Your continence is as clear as a full moon. You are fully proficient in shamatha, calming. 
you make manifest the dharma of tranquility, which can extinguish all affliction, afflictions. May you teach the bodhisattva path for the benefit of sentient beings. Pure are the Buddha's land and lifespan, his physical body and retinue, his actions of body, speech, and mind, and all his other attributes. May the Tathagata expound now the pure practices of the bodhisattva. How do they conquer demons? How do they teach the Dharma? How do they become ever mindful? Please explain this to us. How do, how do those courageous heroes plunge into samsara again and again while abiding securely in non-duality and remaining unmoved by anything? How do they associate with Buddhas and make offerings to them? How do they observe the Buddha's physical body while ultimately remaining detached from all forms? How do they refrain from entering into nirvana before acquiring all merits, though they have realized the three doors of liberation and are free as birds in the sky? How do they know the inclinations and desires of sentient beings? How do they comply with them fearlessly and thereby bring those beings to maturity while themselves remaining undefiled? How do they first give them mundane delights and then persuade them to develop pure minds to help them achieve supreme wisdom and attain anuttara samyak sambodhi, supreme unsurpassable enlightenment? Such doctrines, profound and subtle, may the Tathagata explain to us. Okay, I'm going to pause there. Really quickly, I just want to make clear, you know, this is a particular type of sutra, particular type of text, and I want to just, you know, make clear a few things that are going on. It says it several times in uh, uh, Vijaprapta's the poem, where it's this idea of of the of, of accomplishing bodhisattva hood, the pure practices of the bodhisattva. Indeed, this sutra is about the bodhisattva path. Um, there's going to be a couple of jabs at the Hinayana. There's going to be a couple. It wouldn't really be a Mahayana sutra without a couple of those jabs. But it's not really like that. It's not going to be one of those sutras that's actually about pivoting the Mahayana against the Theravada. This is actually just sort of a Mahayana bodhisattva path sutra. But of course, the Bodhisattva path is, is different than the Shravaka path, the, the path of the monk or the renunciant. The Bodhisattva path, well, you know, it begins with this, what's called this initial determination for Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, this initial bodhicitta or mind of enlightenment, this initial idea of, go, of like Buddhahood not just the cessation of my suffering, not just the, the cessation and ending of my personal anxiety and my personal issues and problems, but Buddhahood. And in that shift from just the kind of small vehicle's pursuit of ending one's own suffering, in that shift to the kind of Mahayana, the great vehicle, the supreme vehicle, the Bodhisattva path, which is sort of about the enlightenment of all beings, it's very important to understand that what makes this a bodhisattva type sutra is that the practice is about engaging with others, how to skillfully, upayakly engage with others. And the, the sutra is going to talk a lot about this idea of like, of like, um, Oh, since you're probably used to it already, I, I'm not going to shy too far away from it. But it's this language of bodhisattvas saving all sentient beings. If you read enough of this stuff in English, you start to get the idea that bodhisattvas have some kind of savior complex. Like that they, they, they have this kind of these delusions of grandeur that they're out there to like save everybody. And 
if you if you have that feeling or you had you have developed that feeling i understand i really do because the the english choices of language here are very like that it's they speak of saving and 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 things like that but i want you to know or i want you to think about this before we even launch into the 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 dharma like the real like you know the real teachings here i just want you to keep in mind that sort of what makes that initial determination for enlightenment of the bodhisattva like what that is is this sort of outward turning of the heart towards all beings and this kind of like oh like yeah i guess it would be like cool if i wasn't suffering as much and i wasn't anxious and all of that but wouldn't it be great if we were all not anxious wouldn't it be great if we were all not fearful wouldn't it be great so the bodhisattva is kind of actually genuinely concerned in like everybody's upliftment here in that way and so when it's speaking about saving i it's like you know, I sometimes joke this idea of like, yeah, saving them from themselves. That's what a bodhisattva is sort of interested in doing, like in terms of, well, in terms of desire, anger, delusion, these kind of defilements or whatever that we're going to get to in a, in a minute. Bodhisattvas are sort of interested in going out there and saving sentient beings from delusion, greed, anger in these things. But as we read through this, I, I also want you to know that there's a very skillful way in which this is still always about oneself as well. You know, it's like, it's almost an upaya. Like, it's not just that the, bodhi, the bodhisattva employs upaya. It's almost like it's, it's upaya here to be like, yeah, people are so deluded, aren't they? Yeah, people are so deluded. We should probably do something about that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so it's this way of talking in the third person about all sentient beings being full of desire, anger, delusion. But there's a way in which, you know, the bodhisattva, to the degree to which they are not enlightened, understands that they are part and parcel of that. And indeed, that idea of being part and parcel of everything is the theme tonight. So we're going to get to that but i just want you to know that or i want you to notice actually that the the whole point of tonight the sutra is this bodhisattva path which is again it's about how to skillfully engage with others this is not how to sit quietly alone <laughs> this is not about that this is actually how to be in the world but as bodhisattva vidya prapta said repeatedly in beautiful ways how, oh, world honored one, how does the bodhisattva do all of this in the world, but not be defiled by the world? How does one move in the world of the defilements, but not be defiled by them? How does one be that lotus flower that rises out of the mud? So I just want you to know that that's kind of going on too. this kind of really interesting position or almost kind of tight rope that the bodhisattva walks in a way between like delusion and total enlightenment in that sense. Okay. Any questions of anything that's come up before I proceed? Again, this is just setting the scene and the Bodhisattva's question is basically how do, how do Bodhisattvas do it? How do they do it? <laughs> right. Cool. Hey, Michael, sorry. Uh, yeah, no problem. I can hear, but bodhisattvas are not necessarily enlightened, right? Thank like you. you can be an op yeah, okay. I was just okay. Thank, thank you. you so much, Connie. Thank you so much. So, on that note, I mentioned several times now that the bodhisattva path begins with the initial determination for Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi this sort of initial bodhicitta idea of like, oh, wouldn't it be great if everybody got enlightened, right? That is indeed the first of 10 stages of bodhisattvahood. The stage of non-regression that we heard about in the beginning, that all of the bodhisattvas had reached the stage of non-regression, not kind of going back to lower stages and kind of certainly not slipping back into a totally deluded person state, that's a certain stage. I think that's like numbers, like stage six or seven. I'm not sure. I don't have my list here. 
But the idea is that there is a, it's called the 10 Bhumis, B-H-U-M-I, the 10 Bhumi stages. And these are these, um, well, stages of development of bodhisattvahood that begin with that initial determination, and then they go up until what's the stage of coronation, when you get crowned and you are Buddha at that point. That's the kind of the 10th stage. Um, and so indeed, this is deal like I can, I'm not gonna I will do it one night the ten stages and in fact there's a beautiful sutra in here that deals more uh, deals very well with the ten stages so I'm not gonna get into the specific stages but I want everybody to know that that um system or structure of these 10 boomy stages is operating in the background of this sutra and it's in many ways going to slowly kind of walk you through that those it subtly walks us through those 10 stages so thanks on that connie okay so on that note thereupon the world honored one told Bodhisattva Mahasattva Vidya Prapta, excellent. It is excellent that you can ask the Buddha such questions in order to give benefit, peace, and happiness to numberless beings and to win over to the Dharma those gods and humans of the present who will be Bodhisattvas in the future. Thereupon, Vidya Prapta, you should listen carefully and think well about what I say. I am going to explain this for you. <laughs> Bodhisattva Vidya Prapta said, Yes, world honored one, I am willing and glad to listen. The Buddha told Vidya Prapta, Bodhisattva Mahasattvas, great beings, have five hidden treasuries, Fuzang, this uh, uh, Bugarba, they're called in Sanskrit, Bugarba, hidden treasuries. Ma Bodhisattva Mahasattvas have five hidden treasuries, great hidden treasuries, inexhaustible hidden treasuries, universally inexhaustible hidden treasuries. Once bodhisattvas possess these stores, these hidden treasuries, they will be relieved from poverty forever. Achieve all the superior virtues that you just mentioned and quickly attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, Supreme Unsurpassable Enlightenment, with very little effort. And what are these five hidden treasuries of the Bodhisattva? They are the hidden treasure of desire, raga, the hidden treasure of anger, dvesha, the hidden treasury of delusion, moha, the hidden treasury which is afflicted equally by all three defilements, desire, anger, and delusion. So this is the little uh, all three in one. And the hidden treasury of the wisdom of all dharmas, sarva dharma. Okay. That's where I'm going to pause. I'm, I'm hoping that we can dig into this hidden treasury of desire. Um, but here's the thing about this sutra. I was, I was very excited to share this sutra with you because a sutra like this is one of those um, cusp kind of sutras, which it's a cusp between like Mahayana and Vajrayana, as it's called, or Tantric Buddhism, Esoteric Buddhism, the type of Buddhism that's much more associated with Tibet um, and Tibetan Buddhism. So if you're familiar with Vajrayana, you're familiar with 
that esoteric type of practice in Buddhism, great, because you're going to see, oh, wow, like, this is like the early stages of ideas that eventually kind of flower and blossom into full-on tantric Buddhism, full-on esoteric Buddhism. But this is still sort of not esoteric. It's exoteric. It's, so it's right out there. It's on, I'm, I'm, I'm not a lineage. I'm not ordained. We're on Zoom just about to break this down. So that's exoteric is that it's just right here to be understood. But that being said, this is a very delicate sutra. It's a very delicate sutra because if you don't really get what's being said, you could walk away with entirely the wrong idea. Indeed, that's why traditionally esoteric, tantric, Vajrayana type Buddhism, it's secret and you have a guru because this isn't for everybody. You might get the wrong idea and go off, you know, half cocked, pardon the pun, doing some craziness, right? So... I just need, like, it's like my own, it's like my, I'm morally obliged to do a Dharma talk to prepare you for this in, in that sense. And it begins with this idea of desire. Okay. So, well, actually, it even begins even before that the, with this uh, Fu Zhang, this idea of a hidden treasury. So, this word treasury, garba, which can also mean a womb, right? very interesting idea but it is this idea of like a storehouse so if you ever have ever heard of the alaya vijnana the storehouse consciousness in buddhism the idea of a storehouse a treasury very big and tonight i'm hoping to um unpack the treasury i'm hoping to open that up that idea of what are they talking about a storehouse like a granary and all these ideas like what's what's that all about well, first, so first of all, there's the treasury and this idea of like, um, uh, cr you know, a lot of, a lot of goodies it packed in a treasury, right? And then this is kind of a new one. You know, the, the uh, zhang, as it's uh, called in Chinese, this garba. You've, you hear this a lot in Buddhism, especially Mahayana Buddhism. But a hidden treasury? Indeed, this, this Chinese character and this idea of a, uh, of a, of a blue garba, of a, of a fu zhang, of a hidden, a hidden treasury, that also should be a clue. Oh, esoteric. It's like, this is hidden. This is hidden. So, but again, I'm going to tell you where it's hiding. <laughs> it's hiding in plain sight. But so the idea is that I would just want you to, to know this, this, um, subtle relationship between what would become and what will become Vajrayana or esoteric Buddhism. Okay, so that being said, this sutra has mentioned it already a couple of times. And indeed, I think it's sort of the, um, well, I would say dharmically, it's like the focus of, of it. And that idea is what I've written up on the board here. It's called the Dharma Dattu, the Dharma realm. In English, the Dharma Dattu is often translated as the realm of reality with like, like a big capital R reality in that sense. Um, it's a very, very interesting idea. It's, um, it is indeed a Mahayana idea. This is one of those ideas that really separates Mahayana, later, this later Buddhism from earlier Theravada Buddhism, this Dharma Dhatu idea. Um, and, and again, I think, I think reading the rest of the sutra and finding out about these hidden treasuries, um, I think it'll be helpful to understand what this Dharma Dhatu is, because they kind of assume in this text that you, that you at least know what it is and what it's kind of about. And in that way, the sutra is, is uh, edifying and, well, it, it, you can learn from it if you already kind of have a sense of what you're supposed to be learning, if, if, that, if that makes sense. So, so we're going to talk about some dot twos.
now for the next probably good half hour. D H A T U. A dot to a realm. Uh, sometimes this word's translated as sphere, and indeed the dot to in Sanskrit does seem to have a certain if it's going to be conceived a dot to. Not the Dharma Datu. Just put put the Dharma Datu on the side for a second. We're just talking about the idea of a Datu, a dimension, a realm, or a sphere. And I was about to say that Datus, if they're going to be given some sort of shape, they're spherical in that sense. They're uh... But tonight, actually, what I'm going to do is... Um, I don't know. It might be a magic trick. It might be a magic trick, but I'm going to definitely use a prop. I'm going to use a prop tonight to talk about some dot twos. And this is uh, a lot of my, my um, uh, students, personal students. And if you've been coming to San Francisco Dharma Collective, you may have seen this one before, uh, but there's a new twist. There's always a new twist. So don't get uh, discouraged if you're like, oh, here he goes again. Um, I use this example with my students and when I teach to illustrate an, uh, uh, not the Dharma Datu. I've never used this to, to do the Dharma Datu. I usually use this example to illustrate what's called the Tri Datu, the three realms, the realm of desire, the realm of form, and the formless realm. This is an old Buddhist idea. And indeed, it's not even Buddhist. And it, it was a pre-Buddhist idea. It is a cosmological view that the that Buddhists have, early Buddhists had. Um, again, this is kind of a cosmological view of Indian meditation traditions um, to which the Buddhists really got into the three realms, the realm of desire, uh, the Kama Datu as it's called, the Kama Datu, the Rupa Datu, and the a rupa dot two or the a rupa dot two. So again, the realm of kama or desire, sensual desire, rupa, the realm of form, and then the a rupa dot two, the realm of formlessness. And I'm going to walk you through, if you're familiar with these ideas, again, great. I'm going to walk you through an example that is a very Buddhist example, and arguably it's a very Mahayana Buddhist example of the three realms. And the way that I'm going to do this, and the, and the reason why I want to do it this way, is that traditionally, you know, the realm of desire, the, the Kamadatsu, that's like Mara's realm, the realm of the devil, sexuality, desire, wants, cravings, and it's sort of like, that's like the world. It's like the world, the world of, you know, the world. But then if you do meditation and you like sh do shamatha, you calm down and you calm your mind. The idea is, is, <clears throat> is that you could kind of slip out of the realm of desire and all your cravings and sort of slip into a realm of pure form. And if you are in a realm of pure form, that is called being in a jhana or a dhyana, a meditative absorption, if you're just in the realm of pure form. And there are varying kind of depths or levels of the realm of form, the realm of pure form. These jhanic states get pretty serious. But eventually you could get so kind of at the limits of the realm of pure form, so deep in your jhana or your dhyanic absorption that you reach this stage of equanimity or peksha and you could slip out of that into the realm of formlessness, deep samadhi, infinite space, infinite consciousness, infinite nothing, nothingness, neither perception or non-perception, like really amorphous, you know, conscious states, right? That's that. I just gave you the old school way of thinking about the realm of desire, the realm of form and the formless realm, that this is the realm of desire. 
And if I somehow close my eyes or something or stare at something long enough, I could somehow get to the realm of pure form. And if I kind of come close enough to essentially blacking out, I could be in the realm of formlessness. All right. That was a bit, that's a huge straw man right there, by the way, that I just set up. But I'm going to come at it with a flamethrower because the idea here is, is that I'm about to give you a very, again, different way of thinking about the three realms. And what's important about this and, and kind of doing it this way is that it's about understanding what the Buddhists mean by a datu, a dimension, realm, or again, sphere. Let's forget sphere though. Sphere is definitely a way to spatial. So let's forget sphere and let's just deal with like dimension. The point of what I'm about to do here is to show you or illustrate that the three realms, they're all right here. They're all equally right here, right now happening. And depending on sort of how you're looking at it, that's the realm of desire, the realm of form and the formless realm. And so to illustrate, I have my prop. So behold, the three realms, the realm of desire, the realm of form and the formless realm right in front of you. <laughs> and what I'm going to do is sort of walk you through how that is. Like, well, what is, what are they talking about? What is the realm of desire then? What is the realm of form? What is the formless realm? Well, when I did, when I showed you the prop, when I said, what's this, th th that you knew what it was, well, how did you know what it was, right? Well, you knew based on its form, right? Color, shapes, right? Those things are all quite familiar to you, right? But if I asked you, like really asked you, what is that? What is that? Right? You, you have an idea. I know you have an idea about it right and so hold on to that i that 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 hold on to it because here's the thing when i show you and say what's that right yeah you see the form and all of that but you have feelings about this and I don't care if they're positive or negative. You could, you, if you want to do Vipassana or whatever, you could look and examine about whether your feelings about this are desirous in a sense of money and like maybe, maybe you're broke and maybe you're like, wow, I could use that. And so in that sense, you're looking at it so much not about like what it is per se, but what you could use it for in that way. Or maybe you're looking at it and you're like, that's not desirable at all. In fact, I think that's the root of all evil, actually, right? And, f and, and you could start talking, it's like, I, yeah, that guy, that's a real piece of work, you know? And then we, you know, we get into the whole Federal Reserve System fiat currencies and like all of this stuff, right? Value, money, time is money, paycheck, clocking in, clocking out. All of those, that stuff is in, is, is it, is the dollar bill. If I said, hey, what, what, what is that? And you said a dollar bill. Well, a dollar bill is that, is all of that, right? And so again, from a Buddhist point of view, whether you want this or whether you don't want it because because you're like ew like i don't i'm a i'm a i'm a renunciant i don't want to touch money or whatever right whether your desire is to have it or get rid of it or whatever it is the realm of desire the realm of kama yeah it's about the wanting but it's also about the in a way the the meaning or the significance say the the meaning or the significance that of the, the the denomination right that 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 symbol and we've talked about that symbol before right whether you know we've talked about the the one 
but because you think it's a one that number and because you think this is george washington and the face and you you recognize the way this is again the dollar bill that is an an entity or a let me use a better word that's a phenomena in the realm of desire and that's like that's all projection of of your conditioned mind to to again to want it to not want it to be able to make sense of it at all that's the realm of desire whether you want it or not now imagine through some sort of I don't know, meditation or something, right? You could calm down that overactive mind of yours and just begin to see the realm of pure form. Just light, shadow, darker green, lighter green, the, not a number. Not a number. A number is meaning and significance. Just light and shadow, not a face, not a portrait, not a person, not a historical figure, just light and shadow. Indeed, pure form, right? If you could then observe this, not as a dollar bill, but just as, I don't know, a green sheet of paper, right? With, with some numbers on it, right? I made a Buddha buck right but the idea is that if like when i when i showed you this one you didn't have the same kamadatu and you know why because you looked at it and you're like i couldn't buy anything with that i you know oh i could i could buy that i could i couldn't buy anything with that so you're you're looking at the realm of pure form and you're you're saying oh yeah this is so the realm of pure form is just the color, light, shadow, not what it means in context to a larger world. And indeed, that's a heavy meditation to be able to see the realm of pure form and to not see a dollar bill, but to see something closer you know, to this in that way, right? So the realm of pure form Here's another one, right? What's that? It's so funny, right, that you may not know what that is, but you know what that is, right? It's so funny, right, that you know what that is. Like you that you know it's it's currency or money. It's I think it's bot. I think this is Thai bot or something. I don't even know, but again, it's like, oh, dude's face, some numbers, rectangular sheet of paper cartoons right so the idea is is that you you do know about form and that you are you are distinguishing these two or say these these three you're distinguishing them based on form but but then when you're like but which is the one you want then you then you're in the realm of of comma everybody following me these on these realms right so the realm of desire versus just the rectangular sheet of paper the green rectangular sheet of paper right of course it's not paper right it's cotton so again this goes on and on but the, now if you understand that the realm of desire and the realm of pure form are equally right here but it's your sort of deluded mind that either cannot not see a dollar bill or can't and concede, oh yeah, that is a dollar bill, but it's also light shadow, da 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 da. Now we're gonna go to the formless realm, which is also right here. And the way that the realm of, so form, form again is like shape, color, right? Simple stuff, right? Formlessness is, is uh, no form no uh, qualities per se, like no visible form, no auditory form, olfactory form, no form whatsoever. But that's right here too. And here's how that works. <laughs> when I said, what is that? You probably didn't say, 
a guy with a dollar bill. Right? You probably didn't say, you know what I mean? So there was a way in which when presented with a, a variety of phenomena here, man, oh my gosh, this little, this little rectangle here is teeming with phenomena, right? But when I said, what is that? Your mind was able to and delineate and separate out from my hand, from all of this and say, oh, that, you mean that singular entity? You mean that singular entity in your hand? Oh, that's a dollar bill, right? Well, just the ability to delineate me from it and separate them two, separate the two involved what in Buddhism and Indian philosophy is called uh, akasha, space. And space is not in, is not outer space. Space is is here, space. And that you separated out the dollar bill from the guy holding the dollar bill, right? That is possible. It is allowable because of this realm of formlessness that we are actually always in and through the process of discrimination and by which i mean that delineation separation through that out of infinite nothing out of infinite space formlessness there emerges a guy with a dollar bill now if i said what is that And your mind, if, if, you were, if you were playing along, then your mind should be like, I have no idea, right? Because <laughs> it's like, I, I have no clue. <laughs> but, if I, but if I said, what is that? And I said, no, the portrait. The portrait, you know, of the person. Then you would have to create space between the portrait and this thing that the portrait is on or that the thing that the, that the portrait is part of. And now all of a sudden you in your mind just separated out the George Washington picture from the dollar bill, but isn't the dollar bill a portrait? Isn't a dollar bill a portrait of George Washington? Isn't that what they are? They're little portraits, right? So how is it that you're able to separate out the picture from the rest of the bill how exactly are you doing that <laughs> right i mean because as far last time i checked this is ink and the ink is part like oh you're doing it by discriminating differently by separating out differently so it's this realm of infinite space or formlessness that the mind the discriminatory mind creates order out of and says, no, not this, that, not this, that. And then once it has created order and separated out realm of pure form now, oh, look, look oh, look, rat, oh, he's got eyes. Oh, look, oh, it's a bill. Oh, it's a dollar bill. Oh, it's a Federal Reserve note. And now we're in the commandant too and I'm at the grocery store buying something. And so the idea is, is that when you're at the grocery store buying something with your dollar bill, you're, it's the realm of desire, the realm of form, and the formless realm, all right there, depending on your state of mind. And I want to remind you, too, that to really, really see beyond this as a dollar bill, to like really see it just as, as a play of lighter, darker, with no like meaning or significance that's that's a, that's a state of mind that's a state to be in if if you if you understand what i mean i don't what i mean is i don't know if i could ever do that <laughs> that level of diana where this is actually meaningless in that in that sense but still delineated i don't know because again as soon as i see this it's like oh conditioning the conditioning pops up and i know what it is even though I've never seen it before or anything like it. So, well, 
Um, yeah, do you have questions? I feel like, you know, the difference is a little bit like there is this, you know, ultimate understanding, what you just explained, you know, the formula is the ultimate understanding of phenomena in general, that it has no characteristics, right? And then there is the consensus uh, reality where um, when I go, when I'm in the bank, then the dollar bill has a different meaning because we live in a world of symbols, right? And so in, in a bank, we all have the consensus of reality that bill is this or that, you know? When I give a baby a bill, obviously the baby has no understanding. So for the, for the baby, it's uh, whatever, uh, you can, it draws a picture on it. Yeah, so a paper to draw a picture. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, my awesome. I don't know my conclusio, but I no, no, no. Also, awesome point on the consensus reality. I definitely put the comma dot to in the realm of, of consensus reality in that sense. In, in in many ways, actually, all three of these realms are going to be consensus reality as far as where I'm hoping I get us tonight. Um, the idea, and actually, your baby and uh, the baby uh, reference is awesome. Because the idea is, is that indeed a baby, you know, you, you know, you could, we could pretend to imagine, we could pretend to imagine what it would be like to be a baby, to be, to not see this like we adults, we have worked so hard our whole life for these, right? And that, that then to not see this as my hard work, to not see this as potential, to not see this as like potential charity, to not see this as potential, right? A baby, it's like, you know, it totally, that that's a baby in that sense is, is kind of more in the realm of form. Now, I don't think so because the baby's operating from a certain level of desire, which is, is that edible or not? And so the, the realm of desire, I don't ever really like to give babies a free pass into enlightenment that way because they seem very desirous. But the idea is that a, a baby was operating in a very different comma dot to and would not see this as the money that we do. Again, the baby might see it just closer to the realm of form of just like, oh, yeah, rectangular, thin, right? Thin, rectangular, all of those, all of those kind of qualities. The important thing, and I'm going to start kind of ooching us towards the, the Dharma dot two. So another dot two, another dimension, another realm. But this is the realm of truth, Dharma, or the realm of these kind of Dharmic relationships. So the idea is, is that in older so like what would be called Theravada Buddhism, the comma dot to here, this is terrible. This is terrible. I mean, this is the realm of desire. This is Mara's realm. This is the suffering. This is the dukkha. The realm of pure form and being in a nice jhana. Oh, that's, oh yeah, that's nice. That's nice. But you're still discriminating this from that. You're still discriminating me from that, me from you. There's still discrimination going on in the realm of pure form. And so the formless realm, ooh, right? It's so equanimous. And so what I'm getting at is that in earlier Buddhism, there was this sort of way in which the formless realm was like pedestaled and the realm of desire was like, you don't want to be, you don't want to have anything to do with the realm of desire. What I'm about to explain regarding the Dharma dot to is sort of this like bodhisattva vision, bodhisattva vision glasses into the three realms. And the Dharma dot to is a very, very tricky idea. But what it is, is it has to do with well, it has to do with what well, has to do with dependent origination. It has to do with codependent arising, the pratitya samudpata. But it has to do with this idea of 
discrimination, separating this from that. And what I mean is, is that if we go back to my initial example of the, the realm of desire, right? Well, the, the realm of desire is, uh, I'm discriminating based on the symbols of all of this. I, I, I am discriminating that this is not a $20 bill. It's not a $50 bill, it's a $1 bill. And I'm basing that on its form. But the idea is, is that to do that, to say this is, this is a dollar bill and this is what it means is a act of sort of discrimination. And, and indeed in the realm of desire, in the Kamadatu, the discrimination gets gross. It gets, it gets really, really gross. It gets really out of hand because people don't really understand what is going on. And so they keep doubling down on it, on the discrimination in that way. The idea is, is that if you kind of recognize all of the Kamadatu as discriminatory, I want this, not that. Uh, this is pretty, that's ugly. This is helpful, that's not. That's all discrimination. You would think that then the realm of form is sort of not discriminatory, but indeed, like as I explained it, it is. Because to discriminate this from that, this from that, all of that is discriminatory until ultimately, you, 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 if you followed my lesson, the idea that things are sort of emerging out of a formless realm based on discrimination, that if you had decided, you know, that I was talking about the whole mise-en-scene, oh, it's a, it's a guy with a dollar bill. It's, that's a, a situation, one noun, one noun, guy with dollar bill, right? A noun phrase or whatever, right? But then depending on where you start to cut the, the, the image up or the whole idea, it changes what things are in that sense of what it is I think I'm even looking at, how, how many I think I'm looking at and all of that. So what the Dharma Dhatu is, is this realization that at the heart, at the core of the realm of desire, the realm of form, and even the formless realm, at the heart of it is this discriminatory act. And that based on that discriminatory act, they're sort of, um, well, it's sort of a, a certain dependently originated reality arises based on each and every little uh, clinging discriminatory choice. So just like I was trying to get across with the Kamadatu, Rupadatu, Arupadatu, that they're all right here. It just depends on how you look at it. And if you're looking at this des uber, uberly desirously, it, it's hard to see the realm of pure form and the formless realm. It's, it's hard. But they're right here, in a sense. And in the same way that I was trying to explain that they're all right here, the Dharma Dhatu, it's not that, it's not that the Dharma Dhatu is right here as well. The Dharma Dhatu, this realm of truth, is this kind of understanding about how all realms work. All realms all realms work on the same principle. In fact, all phenomena is manifested based on the same pratitya samutpata principle. And so if you get that, that is the Dharma Dhatu. It's not a realm, it is a, well, it's an understanding about the nature of phenomena. It's an understanding about the deep, deep interconnected nature of all phenomena and it's and that deep interconnectedness is very very subtle um in, indeed there is a certain kind of um well it's it it's the proverbial uh the proverbial butterfly that flaps its wings in, in South America and creates a hurricane in Florida or whatever, right? That old, uh, you know, pop, pop legend about the butterfly, right? So that idea 
of all phenomena in the world, a butterfly and, and a beach in Florida. The idea that they are all interconnected in some kind of web so that even the butterfly flapping its wings has this kind of reverberating interconnectedness that it manifests even then in a hurricane in Florida. That is not what we're talking about. It's not what we're talking about. It's nice. It, it, I think it's a certain like um, important thing to understand that indeed we all breathe the same air. Indeed, we all drink the water and, and take the sunlight, right? So there is this way that at a natural, physical, even metaphysical level in that sense, that there is a deep interconnectedness in which when the butterfly flaps its wings, it causes a hurricane in Florida. But it's not actually what we're talking about. And the reason why I say that is because what we're talking about is an, a, an interconnectedness that is so deep that the very fabric of being of the butterfly is contingent upon not only the beach in Florida and the clouds and this and that, but all other things. I gave an example of this a number of weeks ago, months, maybe even months ago now, and it's the example of the alphabet and the example I've given of the alphabet is that if, if I didn't have so much on the board already, I would do it. But if I were to, if I were to make a shape, right, that looked kind of like that, you know, looked like the letter A, the idea is, is that you, the, in, within the kamadhatu, within the realm of desire, the mind that's been conditioned to see that shape would see the letter A. And they would be like, oh, wow, he, he made such a nice letter A, right? It's so uniform or whatever, right? But, and that's the realm of desire that sees the letter A. It is the realm of form in which it's just slope, slope, line, <laughs> not a letter, just a shape, right? And then again, of course, it is the realm of formlessness, in which you are discriminating that from not that for there even to be the slope slope line right so that's the genesis of the letter a from formlessness to the form to the comma dot to where there's the meaning of it oh it's the letter a but if you were there for that lesson about the alphabet or if you just follow along right now the idea is is that in so far as that shape is the letter A. It is also kind of secretly in a hidden, hidden treasure way, actually, in a hidden treasury way. It is actually a storehouse of all other letters in the alphabet. B, C, D, all the way down to Z. And that's because a, a, a letter A is part of a logical matrix called the alphabet. And what A is, what an A, the letter A is, is not Z. Like that's what it is. And, and, and I mean that in the sense that the letter A needs the letter Z to be the letter A. It, wouldn't, it could never be the letter A without the letter Z. And so even though I'm showing you the letter A, I'm actually eliciting the conscious response of the letter B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way to Z. In fact, indeed, all the other letters are hidden, contained in any one letter. Michael, are you the, sorry, please. Are you referring to the, um, I think it's called holographic principle, which is... Um, in every, you know, in every drop, the whole ocean is, and in every, in every single moment of existence, right. the, the no. whole world arises. Is it me, uh, Katie, or? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. You freeze. <laughs> you and I think Michael... Not 
Oh, Mike, sorry. I think we lost you. Can you repeat it? I think you freezed. Okay, I froze. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Connie, as, as usual, you're always one step ahead of the game. Yes for tonight. If, if anybody in the house is familiar with the, the idea of the holographic universe and the idea of holographic principle, which is this sense, if you don't know, that if you have a hologram, like a holographic image, right? Like, let's say I had a holographic image that made it look like there was a dollar bill, right? And that this plate, this holographic plate, contained the holographic information for the dollar bill. What's really interesting about holographic plates that create holograms is that if I were to split this plate in two, that or close to that, I would actually then get two little dollar bill holograms. It's not that the hologram gets split in two and you have half the hologram over here and half the hologram over there. You actually would have two smaller dollar bill holograms. And then if I split those into half, I would have four. And it would go ad infinitum because each cell of a holographic plate contains the, all the information for whatever the hologram is. So the holographic principle that Connie just mentioned, and there's a great book called The Holographic Universe that was pretty popular a while ago that sort of talks about seeing the universe holographically. If anybody's on that tip, yeah, that's sort of what we're talking about tonight is that that idea that I was sort of referring to with the idea that inside the letter A are all the other letters. But if you don't, if you're not thinking dharmically, right, this is very subtle dharma. And if you're not thinking that way, well, it would just look like, it would just look like the letter A, right? But dharmically, you know, oh, no. The letter A is actually B, C, D, and all of those two. And so that idea that any one letter, that the letter A or the letter C or whatever, kind of contains all the other letters, that principle, what I call the, or what you call the holographic principle a minute ago, that is indeed what the Dharma Dhatu is all about but at an even wilder level, level than alphabets and language. Because if you're following me, what they're saying is, is that these phenomena, and I don't care if it's a book or my glasses, right? So it's like, if we were to take glasses, right? Glasses imply and only make sense as glasses by implying eyeballs. And humans and of course that bendy part ears so there's this way in which you can look at any phenomena as what it is but also like what it ain't the kind of flip side of everything and that's where it gets trippy in terms of a holographic universe where you really start to see any given phenomena and by phenomenon you folks i'm talking about you name it it doesn't matter big or small uh, a feeling, a thought, an idea, a color, an abstract notion, God himself. It, it's like any given phenomena, by virtue of being a phenomena, <laughs> contains all, over, all other phenomena. <laughs> that is the Dharma Dhatu. And therein kind of again lies this idea where the three realms are all right here, and the very principle upon which they work is the Dharma, is and the Dharma Dhatu. Okay, so that was a lot. Questions, answers, ideas, or comments? Is that last idea related at all, to, related to the mustard seed, the mountain thinning within the mustard seed? The fact that once you have the concept of the mustard seed, it also contains the concept of the mountain and everything everything else uh yeah eric you broke up a little bit there i, I guess it's again i'm sorry folks um can everybody hear me okay take that as a no 
No, we can hear you. You're a little stuttery, um, okay. but we can hear you okay now. Okay, so we're back. Um, Eric, I did start to pick up the beginning of your question, which was about, does this have to do with the, the putting the mountain in the mustard seed? It, it absolutely does. It absolutely does in that sense of uh, really understanding. Well, actually, it, it absolutely does. And I'll give you the key line for understanding the connection, which is when Vimalakirti or whoever it is, when they say, without shrinking the mountain and without growing the mustard seed. And it's this idea that they're, they are already contained within each other in that sense. Yeah. Okay. The similar question. Yeah. Perhaps even the exact same question, but I just want to make sure that I'm not making like a crazy inductive leap. So like the, the letter A, not only is it not the letter N or the letter Z, but it's also not a number or an apple. And so, it's like as soon as that, as soon as one thing exists, all the other things exist along with it. Okay, cool. Thank you. So I think I think the last our uh, last bit of time here together is probably going to be much better spent with a few more Dharma Datu analogies than trying to get back to the text. I think we'll pick back up on our hidden treasuries next time. Um, cause really just opening any one of them, we don't have it with the time for it. So I do want to just share with you, especially on Katie's last uh, note about the, it's not just that it contains all the letters. It's sort of a non number in that way. And it's a non apple and it goes on and on and on. So this idea of the Dharma dot two of this realm of reality in which all phenomena are seen and understood as interpenetrating one another because they all contain all each other, right? And so any given thing is just sort of a, the the forward most fast of some sort of like disco of reality. About it, it became the foundation for a whole school of Buddhism called the uh, Huayen, the Qigong in Japanese is called the Qigong school in, in Chinese it's called Huayen Buddhism. And there was a monk in China who tr tried to basically get the empress. It was an empress at the time. It was a, a rare moment, moment in Chinese history where the, where the supreme ruler was a female. And this monk was trying to get the empress to support this kind of Huayan, in, interdependent uh, Dharma Datu type of Buddhism and wanted to explain to her this idea of what's called Indra's net. And there is this sutra, the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Flower Ornament Sutra, that talks about this idea of Indra's net. And Indra's net is an illustration, a metaphor, an analogy for the holographic universe, for the letter A thing that we were just talking about, for the mustard seed in the mountain. It's it's so rather than holographic universes and holographic plates, the sutra, the Avatamsaka Sutra, and their and this monk used the analogy of this net. And indeed, it's to be imagined as a spherical uh, fishing net. Like if you imagine like a fishing net, but a giant, giant, giant fishing net, spherical. And at every intersection of the ropes of that net, anywhere where two nets or three nets or four nets, whenever the ropes cross, there is a perfectly mirror-like jewel in this giant sphere. And what the sutra and then this monk to the empress says is that 
the interesting thing about Indra's net, as this is called, is that if you go up to any of the jewels in the net and you look very closely, you will see all the other jewels in Indra's net, in one jewel. And what's even wilder about it is that if you look very, very closely into this one jewel and you're like, oh, look, yeah, there's that jewel over there and there's that jewel over there and there's that jewel over there. Whoa, yeah, right. There's all of them. Oh, but wait a minute. If I look into that jewel in there really carefully, wait a minute. It's this jewel. <laughs> this jewel contains itself. Because this one's being reflected in that one and then being reflected back in this one. So it contains itself. Well, that's weird. <laughs> Not only that, the other weird, interesting thing about Indra's net is that if I were to take out a Vajra, my Vajra Chedika, right? My Vajra cutter, and I were to make a, a mark, a, a blemish on this, that blemish would appear instantly in all the other jewels of Indra's net. And it would appear not like it would appear in this one, then that 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 one, until it eventually appeared in all of them. It would appear instantly. And that is the simultaneous codependent arising nature of, of this idea. It is not a butterfly and a week later a hurricane. It is a hurricane, <laughs> lightning lightning obtainment pow like that so that's indra's net and actually this monk uh in china in like the fifth century he made an indra's net he made a, a net of jewels or, uh, or sorry a net of mirrors so he manufactured all these mirrors and then he put a buddha statue in the middle of the sphere and it wasn't a quite a sphere, by the way. It was sort of up, down, and all the sides. But if you've ever been in one of those hall of mirrors, he created a hall of mirrors. But the beautiful thing about putting the statue of the Buddha in the middle is that the Buddha appeared in all the jewels. And so that was sort of this subtle message about the Buddha nature being in all phenomena. And it's in all phenomena because of what we've talked about all night. <laughs> Because of this principle, if all things contain all other things, you do indeed contain the supremely enlightened Buddha. Like, for really, for real. Because if the letter A contains all the other letters and all the numbers and all of this and that, you indeed contain Avilokiteshvara, Bodhisattva of Compassion, and Buddha, and all other phenomena. So that's sort of where this sutra is going a little bit is with that wild idea. Questions, ideas, comments? None? Oh, no, I, I, have, a uh, I have a comment. I think, um, yeah, A, it's very, very beautiful. Um, and um when you say like you know in your mind in you and i there's everything right even you know even buddha and then you you know which is very beautiful and but then you think like well there is no i a separate i in that sense you know so i just want to i think i want to bring in this non-dual you know um thought and concepts rather than staying in in uh, duality so anyway that, that's what came up in my mind yep yep yeah and, and i now i wish we had another hour and a half because that's a great segue to these hidden uh treasures here uh so we're gonna have to wait on that till next week um but on that note though about the non-duality and about the i you know a lot of these Mahayana teachings, un, unlike the Theravada that are a little more about like Anatman, no self, get over it, get over it, get over it. Like the Mahayana is actually a little more curious and interested about 
where this persistent sense of self comes from and understanding its origin, not, you know, just beating it into submission until it's gone in that way. And so, yeah, Connie, we'll get to the non-duality, but it's actually kind of very interesting to stay in duality, but in the Dharma Dhatu, if that makes sense. Like when you're like, okay, oh, okay, so I'm the letter A then, A. Uh, so, you know, so it's, uh, yeah, so again, if we had more time, I'd go all the way through. We didn't get to the Naga, this amazing Naga that lives under the earth that makes the, oh my God, so many things. Um, but you know what? I'm in no rush to get through this sutra, folks, because it's just, it's too rich. It's too good. Um, so I am on no schedule. I thought we might get to one treasure. So yeah, all bets are off next time. Um, so that being said, I think I'm going to, I, I had one more thing to say about the, the, the Indra's net. That's what it was. That's what it was. It's the, the kind of the connector. This is a nice uh, point to end on. It's the connection with the Vijaprapta lightning obtainment. And you might have noticed at the beginning of the sutra, uh, Indra, Chakra Devanam Indra is back with his Vajra, right? He showed up. So Indra is a fun, um, connect, like a, a, a thread that connects this to the Sarata Sutra I did a couple of weeks ago where we have Indra's appearance. Indra, of course, is the god of lightning, the god of thunder. That's why he has the lightning bolt weapon. So, you know, I don't think it takes a lot of deep analysis to be like, why is Indra there when the lead Bodhisattva is named lightning obtainer, right? But I also want you to know that there is a very, oh, and then I've been talking about it all night, Indra's net. The reason why it's called Indra's net is because it's about this god Indra, who is the god of, well, Indra's net, be, before the Buddha got a hold of it, <laughs> Indra's net was just a, a, uh, a, a euphemism or a way of talking about constellations and the stars of the sky, that that was Indra's net, okay? And so this is a real twist, you know, uh, star ch children out there. This is a twist on that Indra's net where like, well, sometimes like when I, when I do Indra's net in person and I have tried to, as upayakly as I can, I tried to bring us all into Indra's net by kind of gesturing that we all get inside this jeweled net, right? And it's from in, the uh, vantage point of inside uh, Indra's net that you can kind of really start to see all the jewels, right? All the stars in that way. What I like to do is I often like to then take Indra's net and kind of drape, drape it over the world <laughs> so that you do start to see, or at least an, analogously, oh, wow, look at all the jewels. Look at all the jewels everywhere reflecting all the other jewels in Indra's net, right? So that's kind of just uh, a way to connect Indra, the lightning with this uh, Dharma Dhatu, but it also, very last, the, when I made my Vajra, I use the Vajra Chetika, the Vajra Cutter too. I do these things that I don't even know. So the idea of the Vajra Cutter and the instantaneous uh, blemishing of all the jewels, the, 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 uh, I don't even want to call it a speed. I don't want to call it a rate, right? Cause those are wrong, but the, the simultaneousness of that, where they are all blemished, that's Vajra. That's the lightning metaphor. That's the lightning obtainment is like that. Oh, like the instantaneousness of this reality we live in, that's to obtain lightning and thus the Vajra Indra. Dharma Dhatu connection. <laughs> okay. That's it. Thank you all so much. So much more to come. Hidden, hidden treasures. Hidden treasures.
Thank you so much, Michael. Very much looking forward to spending some time um, with this. This has been awesome. Uh, and so I just put a link in the chat. Um, there is more MC Owens at the website uh, that I just linked to. Um, go check it out. He has a Patreon. He takes private students and you can read a sutra with him one on one. Um, so do that. Take advantage of that opportunity. And um, then if you would like to practice Donna for the collective, I will drop some links now um, in the spirit of interdependence and interconnected uh, interconnectivity we are as a collective uh, completely born and recreated you know moment to moment from Donna both um, people giving freely of their time and of their money or of their George Washington portraits however you want to think of it um, into the collective that's the thing that makes this place continue to happen. Um, so if you're able to give from a place of kind of freedom and joy and generosity, please do. And if not, please don't. Uh, we're committed to never putting a financial barrier between anyone and the Dharma. Um, so your presence is a gift in and of itself and presence creates the collective. And I have two things to share that are coming up soon. Um, one is in this kind of illusory duality of inner work versus outer work, you know, work we do on ourselves versus work we do in the world, there's a thing that can happen in spiritual communities where you get this kind of bypassing, where you think, well, I'm sitting on the cushion, I'm healing myself, so I'm doing everything I can. And then there's the opposite end of the spectrum where it's kind of like this mindless attempt to change the world without kind of being intentional with energy. Um, and so we're about to start a multi-week series where we have a different teacher every week answer the question, how can practitioners meet this moment, this moment in history, both, you know, politically and everything else. Um, so it's going to be each teacher gets like total freedom with their class. And so they'll usually be kind of a guided sit and a discussion, but it will be all these different Dharma voices answering that question. So that's starting not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday, the 14th, uh, with Mary Stancavage. And then we'll be going from there. So mark your calendars. Uh, subscribe to our newsletter for more details. You know, we send out one email every week, every Tuesday. We don't sell the list. Um, hang on, I'll put the actual link in there instead of the same donate links again. There it is. Okay. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to tell you in the spirit of kind of interconnectivity and co-creating a community, we are doing our best to detach ourselves from systems that are not necessarily wholesome. And in that sense, we used to spend, we used to throw about like 50 bucks a month at Facebook and Instagram to just get the word out about ourselves. And we're not doing that um, this month or next month there's been like a massive boycott. We think we're really the ones making the difference. It's already affecting Facebook's bottom line. Um, but in order to kind of do that and sustain ourselves, it would super duper help us if you have like a friend who you think would be interested in the class to tell them, or if you are kind of on an, in an online community to do a little bit to amplify us. And that gets us much closer to where we wanna be, which is growing organically through the community rather than having to attach ourselves to commodified systems um, in order to sustain ourselves. So tell a friend about us, subscribe to the newsletter, and uh, see you all back here next Sunday. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody.